Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We praise God together this morning. God bless you for being here. We welcome our visitors once again. And uh, you might be visiting with us for the first time. If so, I usually just let me explain this. I usually have a little bit to say to kind of segue into what we're talking about. But we're going to get right into it this morning. But we do want you to know we're glad that you're a part of our service and hope that we'll all be blessed for being together and that God is present with us and that he is being glorified in our midst this morning. Do you know if you're saved? Are you sure if you died that you would be in heaven with the Lord forever? Do you have confidence in your standing with God? Confidence in your salvation? Are you secure in your mind about that? Now, we have a problem in the church and I suppose in the world as well. And that is... I think there are some who are quite confident that they're saved and that they're right with God when they're not. They may feel secure. They may have this subjective feeling of being right with God when really they're not. So we have some who are confident they're saved who shouldn't be. And then another problem, I believe, is that there are many who are right with God who are in a state of grace, I'm going to say, with God, but they they don't have confidence in their salvation. They lack a sense of assurance or security. Well, that's what I want to talk about in our lesson this morning. I'd like to take what we were discussing in our class in Romans. I already mentioned in our class that you were going to hear some of this again, but I'm going to address it in a little bit different way and expand on it. But I want to look at something Paul said in Romans chapter 5. And I want to call this lesson State of Grace. That's what you can write down. If you're taking notes, you know what to do. Write that down at the top of the page. See it in your mind if you're not writing on paper. State of Grace. Those simple words. You know, I'm from the state of New York. I'm a little embarrassed by that lately. Uh, I know you're proud if you're from the state of Texas. Many of you are living in a constant state of confusion. I was just thinking of all this idea, the state of this and the state of that. But what's most important is the state of grace, the condition of standing in the grace. So I, I subtitled this, The Cross and Our Confidence, because that's really what we're focusing in, is how we can be confident of our salvation and this is something that we'll address what I'd like to do is sometime in the future Lord willing to have a whole series of lessons where we can look at this that's why I'm saving the title blessed assurance you would think why well that's that's your title right there Tyler right blessed assurance well we are talking about assurance our blessed assurance our confidence our security in Christ But we we will elaborate on it more later. Uh, Time constraints, due to time constraints, I'm going to pass through a lot of these things with a lot less discussion than we might be able to do, Lord willing, another time. But look at the text in Romans 5, 1 and 2. Paul said, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. You see, there's our title, Standing in Grace. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, I've already given you the title, I know, but this is still introductory to the, to the points, the five points that I'd like to make this morning. But notice how the text starts, therefore. See, we're jumping into a middle into the middle of a discussion. We've been going through the book of Romans in our auditorium class on Sunday morning. And Paul has been talking about, as we've noted in our class, 
about the gospel as God's power to save. It reveals the righteousness of God, Romans 1, 16 and 17. How God sets us right and puts us in a state of righteousness where we are right or justified in His sight. And He tells us He does that through Christ, through the propitiatory sacrifice or the, uh, the atonement, the atoning sacrifice of Christ. He discusses that in Romans 3. And so He's saying, based upon all of that, what Jesus has done and how we receive that by faith. Therefore, since this is the case, all right, he's talking about the fact that those who are in Christ, now this is the key, he's not talking about all humanity, but those who have responded to the gospel in faith, and all that faith leads you to do to comply with the conditions of salvation that put you in Christ. We'll mention those in a moment. But he's saying, now, therefore, those of you who are in Christ, since you've now, since this is the case, that we have been justified by faith. We've been put right with God by faith. That is, he was talking about, leading up to this at the end of chapter 3, really all through chapters 1, 2, and 3, and then into chapter 4 as well, that we are put right with God, not on the basis of, our keeping law, but in trusting what Jesus has done. So he's saying as a result of that justification, we have peace with God. Peace with God. Because of sin, we're at enmity with God. We're enemies of God. We're in opposition. Now, people may not think of themselves that way. They may say, oh, yes, I realize I'm a sinner. We all sin, but they may not think of themselves as actually being hostile to God, being an enemy of God. But Paul talks about that in this chapter down in verses 10 and 11, that it, when we're in sin, we're in a state of enmity or hostility with God. But now, because of what Jesus has done, that's God's part, and then our faith, that's our part, we are put right, we're, we're in right standing with God. That despite the fact that we've sinned in the sight of a holy God, because Jesus has borne the wrath of God in our place, Paul will go on to say in verses 8 and 9, we now are accepted by God. We're accepted by God. So our acceptance to God, let's ask the question this way, it's on the basis of what? On what basis? Paul says in the passage, it's through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him. It's because of Jesus that we now have obtained access through faith. That's Paul's emphasis over and over that it's a matter of faith. By faith, now it's through Christ. So you see the idea of God's part and then our part to make this a reality in our lives but it's it's through the work of the Lord Jesus through him we've obtained access by faith and then here's our point into this grace in which we stand all right with all of that in view and I sort of rushed us to these points now first of all let's say this this state of grace it's something we first enter and then Paul says, now it's something in which we stand. So we first enter it, and then it's something in which we then stand. So you have to enter into this state of grace first. And Paul will go on to say in Romans chapter 6, this begins... See, when he keeps talking about faith and being justified by faith, unfortunately, a lot of people have been led to believe that that just means the moment you believe, you simply say a prayer and invite Jesus into your heart, and there's, there's nothing further required to enter into the state of grace. But we're not going to go through all this now, but we want it to be understood. As Paul will go on to discuss in Romans chapter 6, when our faith leads us to repent and be baptized into Christ, it's then that we enter into Him. We enter into, think of grace as this room. And you first have to enter into it. And we enter into it by faith at the point of baptism, Paul says in Romans 6, 3 through 6, in verses 16 through 18. And then having entered into it, that's where we are now. That's where we stand. 
And so you can think of the fact that we're now sheltered from the wrath of God because we're standing in the grace of God. We're covered now by the blood of Christ. We've entered into that state. And now we're standing there. All right? Now our confidence then, Paul will say, is something that is a present reality. It's something we have over our present condition with God. We can be confident right now, at this moment, we are accepted by God because of what Jesus did and because by faith we enter into that state of grace, then we have this confidence in our present condition, but also our future. Let's go back to the text. He speaks of having peace with God. He speaks of this grace in which we stand. And then he says we rejoice in hope, hope in the glory of God. We talked about that in class. Hope of actually entering into the glory that God has prepared for His children in chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. Hope of entering into the glorious radiance of God's presence one day to dwell with Him eternally. So we have this hope, and because of that hope, we live in a state of grace. We're in a state of joy. It doesn't mean we don't have sorrows. It doesn't mean we don't suffer. In fact, he'll go on to say we rejoice even in our sufferings. But we have this hope, and that hope we want to emphasize here. It's not merely, so it's in our future, my point is, going back to point number two. It's something we're confident in our condition right now in the present, but we also are confident in the future. The hope of glory. But, but to understand how hope makes us confident, we need to realize that hope in the biblical sense is not just wishful thinking, right? Because sometimes we use the word hope that way. I hope I don't trip when I come up the stairs to, to enter into the pulpit. But I, I don't know if that's actually going to be the case, all right? Or you might hope that you're going, that, you know, Tyler's going to wrap things up by the 45-minute mark or whatever. I mean, you know, th- just this idea of something that probably won't happen, but you wish that it would happen. Wishful thinking. That's not biblical hope. Biblical hope is confident expectation because it's in what God has promised. That's the ground of our hope. That's why we're saved in hope, Paul says, Romans 8. In Romans 8, 24 and 25. So it's based on the certainty of what God has said. We're trusting in the faithfulness of God who has promised. Titus 1, 1 and 2. Paul says we have the hope. Listen how these are connected. The hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised. He promised you. You know, a lot of people, they go to the altar and they make a promise. Till death do we part. And they break that promise. They're not faithful to that promise. Many times we're not faithful to things that we promise. God cannot lie. If God has said it, God has promised it, it will come to pass. So that, that's the basis of this future, this confidence we can have in our future state that if I die today no matter what's going to happen no matter what comes I have the certainty of this glorious future this security now next our standing then with God this confidence we can have it's an objective reality and it's a subjective experience I mentioned this in class about what Paul goes on to say about how he's poured the love of God into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. But I want to make it here as well about our hope. You see, it's an objective reality. That is, if we have received the gospel, if by faith we've entered into Christ, we've entered into the state of grace, then we have been put right with God. It is a reality. The problem is is in, do I really know that? Do I really have that? That's what I mean when I say it's a subjective experience as well. The problem is in our feeling that we know it, that we're sure about it. That's where we struggle with doubts on that side of it. It is a reality, but do I really believe that? Can I really know that? Can I really be sure? 
Well, I think we can if we understand. And finally, the last point is that the ground of our confidence is in what Christ has done, not in what we have done. Now, here, here, of course, we need to be careful. Because, as I said at the beginning, there are many people who are confident in their salvation who shouldn't be. They have a false sense of, of assurance or security. And they have this idea that, well, but Jesus died on the cross, and I believe that, and so even though I'm not really a faithful follower of Christ, even though I don't really believe uh, what, what Jesus said in his word, even though I'm not really striving to live according to his commandments. You know, I know Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I believe that, and so I'm trusting in what Jesus has done. Well, it's not a matter of simply uh, that Jesus has done it, and so it doesn't matter how you and I live. We're not saying here it doesn't matter what we believe, that it doesn't matter how we live. We do have to be right in our beliefs. There is truth to which we must submit our hearts and minds, which we must receive, John 8, 31 and 32. The truth about Christ, the truth that we're discussing now, and, of course, other essential biblical doctrines that are critical to our standing with God, that we must believe and accept those things in order to be put right with God. As I said, these are, this is an area where we don't have time to elaborate and, and qualify this more. But yes, we must believe the right things, and we must submit to Christ and strive to follow Him. So it does matter what we do. We are to surrender ourselves to Christ as Lord and live obediently to Him. He saves those who do His will, Matthew 7, 21, those who obey Him, Hebrews 5, 9. So we have to submit to the gospel. We have to live according to God's Word, but we know we still fall short. You see, this is where we struggle then. Am I, am I doing enough? Can I know that I'm right? Listen, we're never going to be able to do enough. We're never going to be able to feel... If we're, if we're looking for our security... And what we do, we're never going to have it because we're never going to feel like we've done enough. We're always going to understand that we could be living more faithfully than we are. And so a lot of times I feel like some of the most godly, faithful Christians I've ever met, they lack confidence because their, their confidence is too much in their own efforts rather than in the work of Christ. And we can have this false sense of security, but this is what Paul is really addressing here in these early chapters of Romans. And think, well, uh, you know, I've got the right beliefs, I'm in the right church, we have the right doctrine, we follow the right pattern of worship, we're doing the right stuff. And so, because of that, see, th there you're trusting in your own rightness. Yes, we have to be right. I said that already. Not, I'm not denying that. But we shouldn't put our trust in the correctness of our doctrine. I'm not undermining the importance of correct doctrine, the essentiality of correct doctrine. I'm saying that that's not where the ground of our confidence is. In the same way with living in obedience to Christ. I'm not undermining the fact that we are called to submit to Him. But, you know, we're living in the secular age. There's a, there's, a, there's a spiritual vacuum in our culture as Christianity has been pushed out of the mainstream as the dominant view on which our culture was built. And so now in the, in the secular point of view, people still want to feel a sense of, of being right, they still want some kind of righteousness. They want to feel righteous, right? But their righteousness is in their own. A lot of times it's in their own. Sometimes it's in political activism, having the right views about what's happening in the culture. You know, being outraged over the right stuff. This virtue signaling where you, you pronounce your goodness. I've seen it on some church signs. In this area, where you're announcing your, the correctness of your view on this controversial thing or that controversial thing. Well, of course, if we believe Scripture, we will line up 
against certain things that are happening in our culture. I'm not saying these things are irrelevant. I'm talking about what's the ground or the basis of our salvation. For a lot of people, their sense of rightness or righteousness comes from their own beliefs, their own outrage, their, the things they condemn or the, the things that they're doing. And I'm saying you can have that same thing even in the church where we think things are right with God, we're right with God because unlike these other people over here and elsewhere in the church or outside of the church, I've got the right beliefs, I'm in the right place, I'm believing the right stuff, I'm doing the right things. All of those things are important, but they cannot be the ground of our salvation. The basis of our confidence has to be in the cross, not ourselves. That's what I'm talking about. So you are going to fall short. Now listen, I want to address this one more time. There are some who are confident in their salvation who shouldn't be. I'm not, I don't mean if you are living like the world and you talk like the world and you dress like the world and you act like the world and you're, you're lukewarm in your faith. You shouldn't have confidence. You're not going to heaven. You're lost. You need to be in fear. You're not in a state of grace. So the problem is I don't want to give a false sense of assurance to people who shouldn't have it. But if you're striving to follow Christ, even though you struggle, even though you fall short, even though we're weak, you can still have confidence, and it's not arrogance because it's not confidence in you. It's confidence in Him. It's trusting Him. It's trusting what He has done not in what we have done. Do you understand? Let me ask you then, are you in a state of grace this morning? See, we've explained what that means. We want you to think about that. Do you know that you are? Are you, are you wondering? Do you hope in the sense of wishful thinking rather than in the sense of confident expectation? Do you, th do you think, well, I, I, I hope I am. You can know. Do you have confidence? You can have confidence if you understand where the ground of that confidence should be. In what or in whom are you placing your trust this morning for your salvation? That's ultimately what I want you to think about because as important as it is for us, Paul will go on to say in Romans, to live obediently to the gospel our trust must be in Him. Let me finish with these lines from one of my favorite hymns. It's a classic hymn. It's one that we sing over and over. Christians sing it and have been singing it for generations. The rock of ages. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill the law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? These cannot for sin atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. And as that hymn finishes, we need to think about this. How will we feel on our deathbeds? And, and that could be today. But will, be, will we be in doubt? Will we be wondering what's going to happen? Listen. Listen. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown and see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. If we can help you to be in a state of grace this morning, let us know. Let's stand and sing this song together.